Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, it's 52 degrees out here. I wasn't aware of how freezing cold it was until I decided to go ahead and pump one of these out. I tend to be doing these and then going to bed because I get really nice and tired. So you know, you guys, uh, I've been doing episodes of all kinds, right? And... You know, it's <laughs> as you might guess, it's not easy coming up with interesting new topics. And so, you know, I mean, I go after the ones that, you know, I find all over the Internet. Because those are interesting as well. You know, flat earth and dinosaurs and moon hoax and ghosts and all that kind of stuff. Part of me likes just having... Some subjects that are just ours, you know, just our little way. I think the dream episodes are fairly original. But here's what's interesting. This episode, I think I'm going to call it uh, How We Don't Think. And what that means is we are so regimented in our existence that we don't even notice it. And I was reading up on some real esoteric things and you know we talk about being in the matrix every once in a while I've done at least two episodes directly on the matrix then we have the flat earth community and within the flat earth community you have several different flavors of flat earth you have dome firmament dome flat earth you have purely ice barrier flat earth with other continents on the other side of that rim And then, of course, you have heliocentric, you have me, expanding Earth, which is uh, something I got off Neil Adams. And then, again, the more I look at it, the more it just is, for me, just completely undeniable. Something occurred to me the other day that, you know, here's an example of where we're debating whether or not we're on a ball or a flat disc or some other gigantic ball. But in terms of our use of the ball... It's just the disc. Sort of like if you put the contact lens down on top of the earth, but the earth is, you know, 100 times bigger. But now, let's say it's a flat earth thing. And let's say it's God flat earth. Here's something I've never heard really brought up. And if you've heard it and you've got a good video on it, please link it down below. But it goes something like this. There's a lot of debate out there. Uh, What's interesting about it is I see debates on Flat Earth which are very compartmentalized, and I like those better. Meaning they're not citing pre-existing documentation. They're just simply going outside and looking. But I saw another video that was posted on the... I think Tim posted it on the Facebook page. And it was a guy who was talking about the elliptical orbit of Earth around the Sun. And his point was that an ellipsis changes the velocity of the body that's on the ellipsis. You can't go the same speed and achieve an ellipsis, because if you're going in the same speed, you'd have a more perfectly circular orbit. And so his contingency was that any speed at even 1% or a percent of a percent would so change our speed that we would liquefy that that everything would be thrown off of Earth. Now again, there's a couple problems with this whole thing because he cited Einstein's relativity. You know, screw Einstein. He never thought up anything. But the idea is we're talking about Earth on like some pool table you know, where there's other relative gravity out here, just like on Earth, right? So, for instance, if I'm a waiter and I'm holding a bunch of glasses on a, on a tray and then I just move really fast and turn, all the bottles are going to go off to the side. And that's because it, it's relative to this planet, right? The planet is the one causing the other force of gravity and I'm creating a differential and, of course, the glasses obey the bigger force, which is the Earth and not me. But in terms of a body moving in elliptical orbit, what's, what's the force that's going to liquefy us? What's the force that's going to throw us off? We're sucked down to this freaking ball due to ethereal winds. 
just like bubbles in water. Again, if you if a bubble can exist in water, it's exactly the same exact thing. Water is space. The bubble is earth. It's just we have more solid stuff on the inside of our bubble, and our water is a lot more um, refined so that it could pass through us and not hit us uh, tremendously. The little bit that it does hit us is where we get the weak force of gravity. But the guy crawled into official science provided by agencies he doesn't trust to prove a point that, in my opinion, is utterly ludicrous. If there's a way the dude can re-explain it so I can totally get into it, I'm into it. But let's, let's go back to how we don't think. Think about the surface of Earth. Whether you think it's flat or you think it's round. This is not going to be a flat earth episode necessarily, but this is going to get us into the realm of how we can understand the paradigm adoption that we adopt even in our dreams. But especially when we wake up. I think I told you guys when I was a kid, I used to dream I was a molecule. And that was my frustration dream. I would go to bed and I was literally like a, like a human cell packed in with a bunch of other human cells and I was so bizarrely insignificant and trapped it was that's where I got my frustration dream and I'm like you know three four years old but look at the surface of the earth okay what do we have here we have some pretty random looking continents don't we just so happens they all fit together on all sides. There's no Pangea drift. It's all expanding Earth, right? Here's the problem denying expanding Earth, even if you're vested in some other thing. I can take a globe of the Earth, okay, and peel its skin off, you know, maybe before they put it on the cardboard globe that you're going to have in your library. I take that geometric skin and I cut out all of the continents, and then I can push them all together and make a soccer ball on all sides. No oceans. It all fits together. Very little changing of the shapes of anything. Okay. How can you adopt anything other than that? I mean, it just does it. But now, the assertion is, is that we're in a very important place and we have this snow globe over us. Because God is right on the other side, just looking down through that little thing, right? Because we need to feel important, because humans have ego. That's where I think a lot of this comes from. Hey, man, I think it's a round ball, and it's expanding due to ethereal winds and electrical universe plasma injection from the sun. Somehow, I managed to maintain my belief in God a thousand percent. Talk to God all the time. I don't need Jesus at all. I don't need that fictional story. I take from it what is good. I leave behind what is the tooth fairy in Santa Claus. There we go. But if this is a divinely created place, here's what I find so interesting. And this is something I have never heard mentioned. The shape of the continents, aside from working with the, or expanding Earth, are completely random. There's no rhyme or reason. We don't have a hexagonal continent, a round continent, a rectangle continent, a triangle continent. Nothing looks like it is intentionally created. Unless you talk to Slarty Botfast, right? Fjords. I used to love making fjords. So, there's this idea that we have this container around us and this perfect you know, dome over the top. I guess it's glass or it's a force field or whatever. It's a water bubble. All right. But then you suggest that there's something underneath to hold all the stuff down below, all the lava and crazy stuff down below. Oil. All right. And obviously, plasma energy, right? If this is a firmament dome, you got to explain Tesla. Now, I mentioned this stuff 90 times in every episode so that you just barf it out when you talk to friends. You need to know what Tesla did in Colorado Springs. It is the pivotal point where that gentleman figured out that Earth has a plasma core and that he could siphon it off and give us free energy forever. Because if we get to the next stage of energy, that's probably where we should start at least, right? But now, let's just say it's sort of like a, 
a pool with dirt in it and some electricity i don't know maybe the maybe the christmas light plug is right down in the center of this pool and all tesla did was sort of siphon off the power off the extension cord to the rest of the uh, flat disc thing right but i look at the other things that god's created the fibonacci pattern which seems to dictate so much of our creation look at a mantis look at a i don't know anything a wasp a human being a bunny rabbit a dog there's all kinds of wild symmetry there's nothing sort of i mean i'm going to say this and i'm going to qualify it but in terms of the geometric decision making of the shape of our continents it doesn't appear to have anything super divine or designed that would match any other living being that reside on these continents And that seems strange. So this is sort of like God's old, you know, days when he was a young kid and he was playing with mud and making mud castles and all that kind of stuff. And he was just like, okay, I'm done with that, but I'm going to leave it there. It's totally random. Then I'm going to get down to business. I'm going to start creating Fibonacci pattern plants and trees and algae and bushes and roses and cactus and all that kind of stuff. Then, you know, okay, well, those things are rooted into the ground. They can't move around and they don't have the best conversations, you know. I bet they would, but... So he starts, what's he start doing? I don't know. Maybe he starts with single cell, amoebas, plays around with that whole thing, gets the whole heartbeat thing going, figures out his little Frankenstein, you know, starting point. And then starts just, you know, pulling together cells. And then you start to see something that looks divine. Life, right? Plants for me are very divinely created. Everything that's alive on this planet, quote unquote, is divinely designed in my opinion. Fish and birds and everything, right? It's just my hunch that if this was divinely created as its container... And it was, it was that we were supposed to be as close to God as we could possibly be without Him intervening in our life and taking away choice. You know, so He has to abstract Himself away a little bit because if we knew all the rules and, you know, what have you, we might be automatons. You know, we'd be so scared of breaking the rules that we wouldn't really be who we need to be. All right, cool. But then it would seem strange that he would leave behind even the faintest chance that man could find the container. Right? Because, you know, for all he knows, the Vikings could have made the decision to go south instead of north. So here they are hauling ass down the coast. They get to the bottom of Africa and they just go, let's go out there. Right? We have the sea figured out. Poof, they go over. Or whoever goes out there. And then let's just say, and of course he's, if it's the firmament dome, he's made the ocean super cold. He's made that continent extremely formidable. It has an altitude, so it gets even colder than the North Pole by 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But what if that's what we did? We went down there, and of course there's evidence that that continent wasn't covered in ice at one point. It was actually... Um, fully greened, which you'd have to explain. But man could have gone straight for the dome. Now we're in the 21st century. According to the Flat Earth Theory, the government went down there with what, uh, was it uh, Colonel Bird? Is that his name? But we went down there, and we've explored it now. We've signed a treaty in 1954, getting all these countries to say, no one goes down there without permission. Well, at that point in the theory of flat earth, we have rediscovered unequivocally the edge of the dome. Then you have to decide what you believe is on the other side. Is it the edge and then there's another ocean, it's tropical, and you have continents outside of that? Maybe. Is it literally dung, 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 like the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica talks about, they found a wall. Wouldn't the jig be up? The second that one human being knocks on that thing, is God going to be literally on the other side going, hey, don't tell anybody, you know, hey, 
why don't you go sign a treaty and just kind of keep everybody out of here? You know, I had to scare the Nazis off because they were down here before you, blah, 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 blah. I keep thinking that if this was a God thing, it would be impossible to go against his will and find the edge. There'd be no chance of us finding the edge. Because if you think about it, we have how many billionaires in the world now? Thousands of billionaires how much money would it take to sit there and go, okay, I'm in Japan, I'm in China, I'm in America, I'm in Russia. Let's build a vehicle that can get over any terrain. And you can build it as big as you want it. I got money. Here's a billion dollars. You can get in this thing and you can just drive. And you're going to go straight to either the South Pole with the flag or you're going to bump into a wall. And then it's got internet. It's a driving house. Why hasn't that occurred? No one's ever questioned, in my experience, the shape of the continents as it relates to a divine creation situation. Now, in my book, I don't know, uh, obviously, how this whole thing began. I know it wasn't a big bang. But we're here. And one of the ways we don't think is we don't think in terms of is. Like I've said in a few episodes, the universe simply is. It had no beginning. It will never end. What we have is quantifiable stuff that can't hide in the universe. Our perception of light and electricity is merely ethereal winds being designated as those things. So the ethereal stuff doesn't pulverize into smaller particles because it is the smallest particle traveling on a constant speed of 50 times the speed of light, roughly. Whatever that speed is, it is constant. It never slows down. If it ricochets off another piece of ethereal matter, it ricochets at exactly 50 times the speed of light. If it goes into orbit, it's 50 times the speed of light. If it vortexes out of another funnel, it's still 50 times the speed of light. Even though vortex is supposed to be able to create more acceleration in any substances caught in it. But then, what if, and this is what's interesting to me, about how we don't think, because it was the, it was a recent definition I read of sort of some matrix theories about how we wake up mixed in with a little bit of multiverse theory. This is all just fun brain exercises. This isn't meant to be taken tremendously serious, but it could actually be 100% true. There's a lot of you that have probably had the thought or you've read about it. I obviously read about it. I didn't dream this up by myself. But the idea is that we wake up, and when we wake up, the universe is created for us personally. And as we go to bed, it goes away. And we turn into a sub-universe where we need to rest and so, you know, it's like the holodeck on maybe 20% of its power. So you don't get the full hard light. You don't get full instrumentalities, your fingers and your arms and your hands. Um, and every once in a while, it might overload a little bit in that area. You take all the energy and you create your hands for one little scene. But then you're just floating around. But what if that's the case? What if these experiences that we're having and the shape of the continents which it's I'm going to negate this in just a second but what if the shape of the continents were merely this serendipitous perception of discovery by mankind we perceived land so we saw land and then we had a tiny experience with water and then we imagined oceans and oceans existed and the coastlines are merely the overall consensus of man's experience inventing this world to create the shapes that are the continents. Now, the thing that I think contradicts that 100% is that man had no perception of Africa and South America butting up against each other. If you study expanding Earth and realize that a lot of the foliage on all the coastlines that connect with all the coastlines, even across the Pacific, you get the same exact trees in California that are over there in China. And so there definitely has been, you know, more, I would say, evolution, where you have more migratory evolution, where, 
animals like the panda bears over there in China and Japan. And then we don't have them over here on the North, North America. And that could be from all kinds of different circumstances where bears from Russia, you know, bred with, I don't know, a polar bear and managed to make a panda bear. Hell, hell if I know, right? But we adopt so much of our reality from the previous day's experience. And what's phenomenal about, you know, when you have a kid, there's a point where your child will start to really track reality. And, you know, you can put your finger up there and move your fingers around and your kid will start looking at your fingers. I remember when my daughter was born, she was tracking everybody in the room. She'd literally look at me, look at her mom, look at the doctor, and she's just been out of the womb a few minutes. And the pediatrician was like, that's a really good sign. Your kid's really looking around, completely knows where she is, and da 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 And it was like, it was freaky. Because as the eyes move around, that's, you know, the eyes are the gateway to the soul. And so when my kid was looking around, I just thought, oh, geez, you know, or how long have you been alive? Because you look like you're, you know, totally taking this in without the ability to, uh, to talk about it. We have a nine-month gestation in, on average inside of our human mothers. And I always wonder about the evolution of the mind as it relates, especially in my opinion, to the symbiotic soul, you're inside your mom. It's not necessarily, you know, it's the real world, technically speaking, but you're not really, you know, you're not out yet. And then, of course, she's talking and she's eating and she's having all kinds of experiences on the outside, which you're kind of getting on the inside. But we're slowly sitting there building a perception of our body while in the womb. Hey, what's this? You know, I got this thing on my face. What is this thing on my face? And it's just like a dog chasing its tail. It doesn't realize that's a part of the dog's body. But at some point, you know, we might, when we start moving around inside of our mothers and kicking and all this other stuff, we're starting to learn. We own this mass. We own this body that we have. And then, of course, freedom, which is such a such a, a fundamental programming of the human mind that the the ruling class, the douchebags, the deep state who want to remove that from us are so narcissistic. They haven't figured out that, you know, remember the very first time, there's probably three moments, I think, when we really understand and feel the power of freedom. Now, there's the little kid in the mall. You'll see this all the time. When your child figures out how to crawl, they start crawling all over the place. When they figure out how to walk, they start walking all over the place. And, you know, you see that at the mall where the the parent lets go of the kid. You know, they're right there. But the kid's looking at this mall going, oh my God, lights and sound and colors and people are happy because they're buying things and, and the kid's just walking everywhere. And of course, the parent's trying to make sure they don't walk out the door, go down the escalator, fall through some railing. But you can see the happiness in that kid's face, right? How about when you ride your first bike? The freedom. Tricycles are pretty good. You know, big wheels when I was a kid were pretty, pretty great. But they just had a, a speed threshold that kind of made it, eh, all right, this is good. But I really like a bicycle because that thing goes four times as fast as my tricycle right away. First time I bounced on a bicycle, I rode down this old country gravel road. It was, it was unbelievable. The amount of the feeling I had, it wasn't just the accomplishment but there was something about you know steve jobs always said you know the bicycle he studied you know what's the what's the least amount of energy for the most energy out that the human body can do to travel and it was a man riding a bicycle then you drive your first car it's amazing you got your own car man the thing goes fast you can you know there's a little bit of status on top of that, but still, it's just being able to go where you want, when you want. The first time you get to drive outside of your hometown as a teenager, 
And because you get to go to your friend's house that's like, you know, 30, 40 miles away. And even though you've done it a million times in your parents' car, now you're in charge, that freedom. And then I think when you get your first place, you get your first apartment, that's a good feeling. It's just amazing, right? You go to the store and buy your first hangers, your first ironing board, all those basic things, your trash can, all that stuff you need. Freedom. Interesting, right? Do we really think about those touch points often? And what does it mean that that stuff is built into us? You know, nobody told me when I was a kid, oh man, when you start balancing this bike and you start going down that road, it's going to be the most amazing experience of your life. Nobody ever says that. In fact, if anything, your your moment's loaded up with 50,000 ways you can kill yourself the second you do balance the bike. When I think about the flat earth thing, which I didn't intend on talking about flat earth as much as I'm doing right now in this episode, but... One of the ways I perceive the possibilities of Flat Earth is to think of myself in that Truman Show movie where it is a Flat Earth, except it's just a town instead of the whole world. And you're now in Ed Harris's little room, which is the moon. And you can go outside and see the city outside and see this, you know, again, this dome on the ground. And then, you know, you think of like Westworld. Westworld sort of has a flat earth island, a a disc of an island where all these little parks are. Of course, Westworld's the one that we saw first. There's going to be different zones if they carry the book and the initial movie through. But I think about, okay, so you're on the outside looking in now. And what would you feel? Would you feel like, let's just say you live 40 years of your life inside this earth dome and you swallowed it because of course you would like everybody did plus you're told it's a round ball and you're told that we have things in orbit and da 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 but let's just say it never happened it was all just a a cabal the people that you call Jesuits well what's so strange about them they're priests that don't want you to believe in God and I just think that's really funny but okay let's just say they weren't really priests they weren't really necessarily an earthly secret society. They were actually the Ed Harris secret society. They were the dome owners. Just trying to keep you from noticing. By selling you this fiction. Why can they get a lot of people on board? Because that's the story. They're like, hey, you know, we're in this container. And it's better that man doesn't find out that we're in the container. Because if they do, then they're going to feel like, you know, the they're captured it's going to destroy society over time. So we need to make, you know, we need to fund space programs, space sci-fi television shows, movies. We need to get a bunch of Neil, Bill Nye, the douchebag guys to act out all this stuff. And the place is getting a little overpopulated based on our resources that we're willing to allocate for the dome. So we need to have a bunch of depopulation stuff. So we've got this little program, Agenda 21. We're going to kind of reset things for a little while. That'll give us a whole whole nother bag and once everybody's dead that the remaining 150 million people that are alive they're gonna love life they don't know it yet they're gonna love it but we're gonna really control them and put it you know surveillance on them and it was like okay i'm part of the part of the gang right but now imagine you were popped out there's a few star trek episodes like this where the they accidentally break the prime directive and take people from the surface of their primitive planet up into the enterprise and they look around, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. They look down on their planet. You know, these people haven't really discovered fire yet. And they're looking out of a spaceship. Now, you come out of the dome and you see what it's made out of. There's no God on the other side. Like, just right there. You know, whatever that would look like. It's not water. It's a container. And we have owners. And they're, like, they're exactly like us biologically, not exactly, but same sort of humanoid thing. I mean, you know, maybe, it is a, maybe it is a big Truman show where they're just shooting movies of our wars and all this other stuff. I mean, Q, if anything, has proved that we live in a movie. Kind of a wag the dog situation. But now they say, okay, you know, we really need you to go back inside the dome because you can't really exist out here because you're really not compatible with us. You know, we're... 
millions of years ahead of you in technology, you're going to feel much more comfortable in your own skin. And it's just like those episodes of Star Trek where they send the person back down to the planet that they came from. And you kind of, you know, you're happy as a viewer of Star Trek, especially to see that occur because you always want to see someone's mind blown when they see a big differential in technology. But in the end, would they be able to accept their old world again? Don't know. My perception of reality as it relates to potentially a matrix is that, yeah, it's so easy to believe that all of this is a computer simulation. That my perception of mass and energy and my body, you, it's a real running simulation. And boy, is it well-written code if it is. It's well-written code no matter what. But, but my perception of 3D is no different than the linear plane of memory in a computer that can simulate, right, through, you know, these transformation matrix algorithms that can take two-dimensional information and project it in a three-dimensional manner, which is where you get video games and 3D rendering software. It's not real, but damn, if you can tell the difference. The UFO that lands at the beginning of this show. I made it in my computer. Sure looks real. If I had more time and money, I could make it look photo real. Damn thing's in 4K. <laughs> you know, it's awesome. Our ego is a very weird thing. The fact that we need one, I think, is very strange. Because I think it dictates the paradigms that we invent to exist. I think we like feeling important, even if we're not willing to admit it because we are aware of our surroundings and anybody was talking, you know, all day long about how important they were, you wouldn't hang out with them much. And I think most people know that. So you don't do it. But deep down inside, you want to feel important as maybe a group. We went to the moon. Why? Because we did, and that makes me feel good as a, as a man, as a mankind, human, homo sapien, right? How else do we not think? Well, there's the whole category of man's inability to deal with the unknown. That's a bit of a problem. So we pretend to know everything. And it's a temporary button on the unknown. And I have to say... I'm all for it, man. I'm all for us coming up with things that can give us a little solace, a little solid you know, ground for our footing. I wouldn't want to go to bed at night and open my door to my bedroom and then it's just a bottomless pit of nothing. And maybe it's cold. You know, it's like you just hop in that room and then, I don't know, you float, uh, you sink, you drop all night long. And then hopefully you wake up and you're standing up again. So I like, I like reality. I, I like generally the reality that we've created in terms of its substance. Obviously, I'd like us to be a lot more intelligent and get along a lot better. Here's another concept for you. Isn't it bizarre that we go to bed at night and we lie down? And when we dream... Several times in our dreams, we walk. We are upright in our dreams. And you might just blow that off and go, well, of course, we walked all day long. And so, of course, we'd be walking when we're in our dreams because we're recreating the reality that we just had access to. But we sit, sit, we stand, we lie down. Those of you... I'm sure almost all of us have had this, if not unequivocally all of this, but, you know, I've had dreams where I'm floating horizontally. I don't see my body, but I feel like I'm horizontal and I'm floating around some scenario and I'm seeing things. And that's where you don't really have control. You're sort of like the car inside the amusement ride, right? I often wonder, and here's a more abstract one, the whole paradigm of I'm going to make a comparison between two different things if I were to say to a lot of you time doesn't exist it is merely illusion of change and because we have memory 
we remember change. I, my hand was here, now it's here. That's time. Boom, boom. So relative to our current state of being, there is time. Because there's change. Now, let's think about counting. You know, what if you got up there and you met God and you go, How high have you counted, God? And God says, Well, there's no such thing as counting. There's no such thing as numbers, quantification. Things just are. But when you were in that human body, and you couldn't go anywhere in the universe that you wanted to, and be at any time you wanted to, counting was a way for you to understand your existence. But then you say, but God, I've got five fingers on this hand and five fingers on that hand and five toes and five toes, two eyes, one mouth. But God says, look, I didn't design you with ten toes and fingers. I just gave you something that could grip something perfectly. Didn't think about the numbers. Then you've met a being that doesn't count but lives perfectly in a world that can create things. Hmm. So could you come back to your world with that beautiful conversation with God and live in a world without counting anything? Well, I need some money. Well, let's put more money in the bank. How much? I don't know. Just more. This person needs more than I have right now, so how do I get more stuff in the bank? Oh, go do a job. Okay, I'll do some work. Do I have some stuff in there? Did you put some stuff in there? Yeah. I don't care how much it is. But I'm looking to everyone else going, did you get as much as you needed? And your bank, you know, whatever, your Visa card's like, I got as much as I needed. And your electric company's like, I got as much as I need. So you're not counting anymore necessarily. You're just getting resources and putting them places. What is important to man is usually related to man's survival. And that has to be that way. We need food and shelter the two most basic things. Once that allows us to gain a little bit of time with our brain, we start to develop intellectually, and then we decide we need a little bit more. We definitely feel lonely. We feel uh, delighted to be with someone. Once you hold another human being, you find out that our designers put all kinds of beautiful things for when you can hold another being to your chest and they want you to do the same and you're in love it's interesting that love it's sort of like uh, let me give you a weird analogy guns need bullets and they need skills to operate most lethal weapon in the world is a knife a knife doesn't need much training it's 100% lethal hell just cutting stuff in in the kitchen has been responsible for thousands if not millions of people cutting a finger off that's how dangerous a knife is right so something very simplistic about a sharp edge well out of all the emotions that we can manifest as human beings love is the knife as it was a love cuts like a knife yeah come on now but it's something that is so basic to our being and the more that we you know, engage animals in a domesticated manner, boy, you can see he could have a pet anything as long as it's raised from its little puppy stage or whatever, its little embryonic stage once it's born and you raise it. I mean, people found bees and raised them. They found moths. They found all kinds of insects and these things develop a relationship with you. Tarantulas. I've got friends with pet tarantulas that act like dogs. You know, they played hide-and-go-seek with the tarantula. It's tremendous. Everything has this love algorithm in it. It's not just instinct. But in a hostile situation, of course, love has to be put aside because we have to deal with that food and shelter thing. So there's definitely stages of the brain. And there's priority to the brain, which again, is utterly brilliant. Now, evolutionists can definitely chime in and say, we'll see, that's the way it worked. The only things that survived were the things that figured out the first two things, which would probably be, you know, 
some ser- creature that serendipitously had a food supply and had a shelter, which you know, is the whole chicken and egg thing about, well, who was the smallest food supply and how the hell did that thing start in the first place, right? There's an interesting channel on YouTube. It's called like the Octopus Lab. And it's this family that owns an octopus and they have a really large tank. It's like 50 to 75 gallon tank or something like that. And this octopus is pretty big. It's about the size of a basketball if it fully stretches out. And they do interesting experiments with this thing. And one of the experiments was that it lived inside this little barrel, which is probably, I don't know, maybe 10 inches deep and maybe six or seven inches wide. Looks like a cracker barrel barrel, you know. And it was just living in there. And so they, they'll they take it out and I guess put it in another container and then they mess with its environment and they put him back in and he or she is engaging in experiments and they took these little blocks and put them all inside the barrel filling it up about two thirds but then they put this other square box in there with sort of like a place where it could hang out put it back in the water and it looked at its barrel and it's like Oh, crap, what the hell's going on here? And looks over at the other thing, and it ignores the secondary place that's been added, and it crawls in because it's so, you know, malleable in its shape. It crawls in, turns around, puts its butt in, and then it starts to kind of scoop the stuff up to create more of a shield. And then someone had the idea of putting in four, three to four um, white bathroom tiles. And it when you see it grab the tiles, it starts to pull them up and create a shelter. It starts to create a door and close itself in. Whoa. Remember an octopus's brain and a super squid and a super octopus that's 50 feet long. Its brain is the size of your pinky and it's a hollow tube. Now again, they say they're, they're trying to come up with other theories that neurons might exist in the legs but, you know, you can cut a leg off of one of these things and it'll grow it back. It's like, hmm. So if you cut all of its legs off, does it become, you know, mentally retarded? And then it grows it all back and it becomes Einstein again? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if I believe that. There are all these scientists in the world talking about digitizing the human brain and putting it inside of a computer. But, of course, they have chosen to ignore the fact that we might have a soul. We probably do have a soul. And that the brain is merely just a proxy for the output. Yes, if you get brain damage, you seem, you know, like you've got problems mentally. You can get a tumor in your brain, you become a serial killer. You can become a tumor in your brain and you think you're ugly when you're beautiful. You think you're fat when you're thin. Doesn't mean we don't have a soul. It just means you injured the mechanism that the electricity is supposed to go through, which is your soul, right? Your soul being the power supply. But now how is Kurtzwell and the Singularity Project not thinking? He's not for one second ever mentioned that I've read the existence of a soul. I'm sure he would think that that is for the superstitious, for those that are religious. And, you know, how can we blame the guy when he crosses over the precipice of capital science, capital S science, and he sees a bunch of people worshiping Santa Claus, and he's like, see, you guys are just completely out of touch with reality. I have the balls to get rid of all your make-believe crap and study science, what I can observe and touch through the paradigms of thinking invented by scientists before me, uh, ignoring everyone before Tesla and Tesla himself, of course. But think how limited it is to have these little sort of blockers in the brain. They can't think the full thought. I don't think any of us can, quite frankly. But we can do tiny little things to ourselves that will you know, be defined as Enlightenment, right? Remember I used to say, enlightenment is merely defined as being able to see more. Okay, well that means less paradigm restrictions. What's interesting is, is I, I don't think I've really ever met a person who genuinely said, I don't want to be smart. 
there's definitely people that are like, ignorance is bliss in this particular area, so I'd rather not know. Because there may be fragile human beings, perhaps usually they've had sort of a checkered childhood and seeing certain things freaks them out or they have a vivid imagination and it's usually triggered by something in their past that takes, I don't know, a zombie show on TV and it turns it into full reality when they go back to their bedroom, even though they are sentient adults that should know better. Okay, well it just happens. I once, I was trying to think what I did. I, I had to take some medicine once. This is about 10 years ago, I think. And this was a very humbling experience for me. And you know, let me know if you've ever had this experience because I think this was super powerful. But I have been driving cars in one way or another since I was seven. My father used to let me steer the car for miles and miles, like 30 mile trips at seven, just sitting in his lap. He did the pedals, but I was driving, you know, licensed by 14. And, you know, just, I, in Kansas, you can have a full driver's license at 16. So I was all over the state by 16. And, you know, and I went and I got such, such a good driving capability that when I came to California, I worked for Jim Hall Racing and so on and so forth. The reason why I say that is that I have a very proficient method of driving. I actually created a little, uh, a little book on how to avoid California highway patrol when I lived in the Bay area. Cause boy, they're just nasty up there. They're like Ohio, you know, 56 and you get a ticket. Apparently you have nothing else better to do. Southern California, not like that at all. Cops down here are so cool. You could be going, you know, 70 to 55 and the cop will just pass you. Don't even care about you. But anyway, I took some medicine. And then I had to drive home or drive from point A to point B in my car. And whatever was in this medicine made me feel really, um, how do I, what's the word I would use? I guess I could use like the word frail or weak or it was just that I got on the highway I remember for the first, and this was probably the only time this has ever occurred to me, I felt very overwhelmed by the traffic. I felt very small inside my car. So this is the most bizarre experience, right? And I remember immediately noticing I was having this emotion and I was thinking, wow, I don't feel as confident doing this. That's the word, probably confident doing this. And so I'm thinking, wow, if I stayed in the slow lane the whole time, you know, I was cool and I wasn't driving out of the speed limit or anything like that. But I just imagined, wow, what if some young kid, I was, you know, I was, I guess, at least 10 years younger, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I can't remember. But, you know, some younger kid coming by going, you know, what are you doing driving so slow? Get out of my way, da 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 da. And being impatient with my sudden, um, I wouldn't say fear, but it was right on the precipice of probably even fear of driving my car because of this medicine that was freaking me out. It made me feel sort of uneasy. I can't even remember what the hell it was. But now, like, you know, 24 hours passes, that goes away. Never had the feeling again. But now I'm, I'm driving in my car. And I'm looking at other drivers having a problem driving because, you know, you have... We have a lot of fresh off the boat immigrants that have never driven in their life. They're getting their first driver's license at 55 years old. They suck at driving. I mean, who the hell could, it just blows my mind that anyone could learn such a complicated art of driving at such a late age, but it happens. And so we obviously have to be intellectual enough to have patience for people that don't know how to drive that well. And the two main ones that we run into all around the world is young people who are learning how to drive and older people that are losing their their acuity. And so they start driving slower because they know their brain isn't functioning as quick as it did when they were in their 40s, let's say. And so we have to have patience. When you see an old person in a car driving real slow, well, that's par for the course. When I, I was driving home the other day from lunch, and I came up on a, I think I told the story in some recent episode, but it was uh, some kid in his driver's training car and she was trying to turn 
a corner and she did the old, the classic mistake we all make at the beginning, which is to break through the turn. Well, <laughs> what happens eventually you stop the car, right? You got to accelerate through the turn, break up to the turn and accelerate through it. And I'm sure the driver was given, you know, the teacher was giving her the, the proper advice. And so she had literally come to a stop in the middle of the apex of the turn and it's a residential road, so there's no cars around. So I just kind of, you know, beamed around her. But I, I knew not to, you know, hot rod around her because that might freak her out even more. And I don't want to set her back in her education of how to drive a car. But just understanding each other's plights is something that we don't do intentionally enough, I guess, right? If you're a person that does that on a routine basis, you really empathetically live through other people's experiences, then you are um, a quality person that we need more of in this world. So have kids, would you? But then let's talk about how we don't think, because obviously the opposite is how we do think. Now, I've touched on this sort of path a few times, but I wanted to, for especially for you early parents, uh, I know some of our uh, a lot of our listeners and moderators uh, are parents. And so you get to have this wild experiment, right? We need our parent, well, sorry, we need our kids to have paradigms of understanding so that they can exist in this world and not eat it, right? Not be, suffer from the world's slings and arrows, right? But here's the trick. The real trick is trying to keep your kid's mind open at the same time it's closing. For every time we learn a paradigm, if the precursor to the paradigm's education is, well, in order to get this sort of thing accomplished with other human beings, as we currently understand it, this is a method of which you can do it. And then the bumper on the end is, however, you might figure out a better way to do this by doing it completely different than this method. We know that there's the old saying, there's several ways to skin a cat, which is atrocious thinking, but the idea is there's several ways to do a particular thing. Uh, look at F1 race cars. Well, they all accomplish the race car a different way. If they accomplished it the same way, Mercedes and Ferrari wouldn't win every goddamn race, right? That's why I like Verstappen. He just kicks all their asses from Red Bull. But do we keep the door open for kids' brains? I don't think we do. I've told you guys this story a couple times when I was in physics class and my teacher starts laying down E equals MC squared and I'd already spent damn near half a decade in that at a, as a, at a nauseating level. And without any internet, without any skepticism books or conspiracy books I felt it was bullshit but he has to teach the class he's responsible for sending us home with this theory from this plagiarist called Einstein and so I raised my hand after explaining and I said look because he gets down to the point where light can't travel uh, sorry that mass can't travel faster than the speed of light and so I said well what if it can what I would have loved for him to do but this was only the 80s and without a lot of beautiful information and, and other forms of thinking available to him. He got angry with me. <laughs> he just kind of said something to the effect of, well, I can't be talking about, we can't go there right now. You know, like this is that we don't have anything to tell you about that, right? I would have loved for him to say, well, let's finish this theory and then let's explore your theory. Because in my book, if you really understand a particular form of science or craft or something, then you're able to invent, you know. But there's also this very strange thing. Let me give you a Godel Escher Bach sort of thought process here. I learned music by writing programs to play music. And so I desperately wanted a keyboard at 14 didn't know where to buy one, didn't have any money. And so I took my computer and I programmed a 
I, I wouldn't say a synthesizer because I couldn't change necessarily the waveform sound. It had its own little music generator in it, but I would type in the notes, the rests, you know, half notes, quarter notes, whatever, and had to play music back to me. Okay, that got me going. Then I saved up a ton of money and went to Wichita, Kansas and bought my first keyboard. And then I started buying and buying and buying stuff. So what ends up happening is I don't have any formal training, but I'm listening to Prince. I'm listening to everything that's out there, Jean Jar. And I'm learning how to do voice leading. I'm learning how the structures of songs work. I mean, just listen to a song and copy it on your keyboard and you'll learn that there's this, you know, the magic repetition of four usually creates any, takes any random notes and turns it into a song. But then I got to California and I got to a music studio and I started laying down tracks of my own creation. And then I bump into this woman who I don't know exactly where she played, but she was this famous, or I was told she was famous pianist in LA. Could have been the Philharmonic or something like that. I don't know how much piano playing they do with that, but she was famous for doing this stuff. Really nice woman. And she was in the room and I didn't know she was there and I was playing on the piano at uh, my girlfriend's house at the time and I'm playing all my stuff, right? And she sat behind me and she goes, what is that? And I said, you know, it's just some stuff I've been writing and I've been recording in this studio. And then she said, man, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, what? I said, well, aren't you the woman that plays the piano? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And I said, well, don't you know like hundreds of songs? Oh yeah, totally, yeah. I said, well, how is it that you can play the most difficult music ever written by the classical masters and you can read sheet, sheet music fluently, okay, but you can't stop for one second and just piece together the stuff on your own. Just let it go, man. Just touch the keys and feel it and and maybe it's a very simple little riff. Maybe it's a really complex collection of riffs that create a, some sort of beautiful symphony or something. But why couldn't she? And it would be a complete oxymoron for the brain to hear the reason why she couldn't do it. Because she learned to play the piano. She got recital after recital after recital until she learned how to replicate other people's music. But that creative gene in her, I guess, was never afforded any time to sit there and just tinker. Because I guess, maybe as a child, she had so much pressure on her to get her recital together. And it's like, great, you can play this thing that everyone knows how to play. Now just chill out. And just, I don't know, look out the window, man. I had this song I just wrote live at the studio once. And... My girlfriend came with me, and I'm here. I'm totally in love with this girl, and we were supposed to get married and all this other stuff. I think I was like 20 years old. She was 18, and she was tired. And so the studio had a sofa just about 10 feet away from me. I'm on this Yamaha DX7, and I'm and it's raining outside. And it's just this little ballad, you know. And so, you know, I just hook up the software, hit record, and I'm just playing this ballad. And I'm just looking at this woman I love more than life itself. The rain is outside. It's just a pitter-pattering rain. The door was open. It was warm out. And I'm just letting the whole thing flow through me as I'm writing this song that I've never heard before. There are so many things like this where when you let go, the universe comes through you. These sound engineers that, you know, work for people like Prince, you listen to their interviews, separate interviews, because he would work 24 hours. He would complete almost every single song that he ever wrote in one day. And the woman that worked with him on Purple Rain said, look, he was at Sunset Studios here in uh, L.A. And she, she said, you know, she, he just made Wind Doves cry in one day. Of course, he had thought about it before. He got his chord progressions down. But by the time he committed to making it, he just would never stop. And then the next day, he just lays down, let's go crazy, all at once. Nuts. But the one thing she said that really kicked it off for me was, it just seemed like music flowed through him. 
he could hear it 100% in his brain, and then he would toil and work hard in the studio to get it out the way that he was hearing it. And, you know, there's the scene in Indiana Jones 3 where they're stuck in this tower and the Nazis are coming up to kill them. It's Indiana Jones, which is uh, obviously Harrison Ford and Sean Connery. And he's like, you know, we got to get out of here. We got to get out. And he's like, his father goes, well, you know what I find is that when I sit down and just relax my mind, the answer comes to me. And he's like, great, Dad, dude, that's really going to help us out. And then Sean Connery sits in a chair and leans back, and it hits a lever, and the staircase forms, and they leave, right? It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek interpretation of that analogy, but that's it. You just relax. One thing I've done on this show since the very beginning is that I look at where we have friction points in society, where I had friction points growing up through, I mean, and you know, you're never done growing up, so it happens forever. But I see people making foolish mistakes that are easily avoidable if that human being would simply have a conversation with another human being about the subject. But we're so, I don't know, we're so full of shit in this world, you know, just look at the posts on Facebook or Instagram, where people are trying to prove they live a better life than they do, that's what we do. It's some weird thing, like, it probably has to do with natural selection. Regardless if we admit it, we want to be with other people uh, in an intimate way. Some people just want sex, some people want the relationship, some people want both. Sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes it's 80-20, 20-80, whatever. But if you seem broken to the world and confused, and you're making mistakes. Well, we don't allow that, you know. So the solution? Well, just hunker down by yourself and try to figure it all out. Hopefully that works. You know, I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos trying to recall and illustrate my own journey, and then sort of like all the stupid mistakes I've made, because boy... I think I, I think I have a pretty good record with the amount of failures I've had in life in order to achieve any success in life. And you'll see these CEOs and some educators get credit for it, but they'll write books about how failure is the greatest thing you can experience in life because it makes you more resilient. It, it lets you not lose your mind when you succeed or when you, excuse me, when you fail, right? You fail and you're like, Oh my God, I'm broken. And no, this is this one little moment in time is going to be a state that I'm stuck in for the rest of my life. Hmm. How do we not think? Well, we we're not willing to give failure some, some value in our life. That's one of the basic things that man hasn't figured out as a whole, right? I mentioned a long time ago, probably three or four years ago now, that, you know, I have relatives of mine that believe completely different things than I believe. And what's interesting is, you know, when you look at, you know, events in 2001 September, when you look at Kennedy's assassination or other things of similar nature, and you look at it, and you can see the conspiracy. You can see the bullshit. You know high school physics enough to know that that day in September could not have occurred based on any explanation that you heard. And so you see it, and you're like, okay, all I need to do is take any non-believer and show them a book in physics over here, and then roll the footage over here and go, see, that, this right here, it's negated by this over here. And we could sit in a laboratory all day long and you could try to create that thing you saw on TV with any type of physical model. We can run the most sophisticated engineering software in the world and that will never occur over there. But in their brain, they come back with the official story. And you're like, what the hell's wrong with you? Why can't you just put two and two together? Why are we debating whether or not we went to the moon? It's absolutely impossible at this current state, at least. It may be impossible forever. Okay, maybe something we really don't consider 
is that multiverse anecdote is that we all do live in our own universe. In my universe, that doesn't work. In their universe, it works perfectly. When they look at it, and maybe they look at the physics book, and I'm seeing this equation one way, and in their mind, they see a completely different equation. I look at the news footage of that day, and I see a 110-story building falling in about six and a half seconds. I look up my book, it's impossible, but they see it falling for a minute, you know? They see everything, but then in their brain, if I say, well, okay, let's just, let's just come down to brass tacks here. How many seconds do you see that building falling? And they open their mouth, in their universe, they're saying, I don't know, 60 seconds. In my universe, they're saying six and a half seconds, <laughs> right? And so we're, we're even taking what people say and we're interpreting into our own world. And I'll give you a really weird example. And I've said this one time before. Have you ever had that morning or evening and you put your best clothes on, you took a shower, you got all cleaned up, your hair looks great, your skin's good, whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable with yourself, you are rocking. You look in the mirror, man, you look tight. And you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a picture of myself to remember this day. Maybe even post it on social media. So you get up there and you snap the shot of yourself. And you look like shit in your photograph. <laughs> and you're like, what the hell's wrong here? Hmm. Maybe through the digital rasterization of your appearance... Maybe the camera is correct and the mirror, because it's more live data, your brain is changing the mirror to make you feel better about yourself because we need that to go out and operate in society. I mean, what if you're dressing up, you're a young single woman or young single man, and tonight you're going to go try to find that special person. So you need to feel good about yourself because you can carry yourself well. You can have some charisma and charm, right? I heard Liechtenstein has a lot of charm. <laughs> um, but you look at your camera and it's like, damn, what the hell's going on? Because your camera has taken a snapshot of reality, saved it in a phone. And even though you can view it, it's not a live reflection of who you are such that your brain can toy with the image. Hmm. You ever um, meet someone? You go to a job interview, you meet someone new... And you feel like you kicked it out of the park. You're like, man, they really, that, this conversation went great. And you find out later, they thought it went completely wrong. And there was just something about your frequency that maybe reminded them of someone else with that frequency who was not so nice. And so even though you were being nice, they saw something completely different off of you. You know, if you're a man talking to a woman maybe they're seeing an evil brother an evil father stepfather but you're not really that person and you're really not doing anything that they did but because you maybe wear their cologne you sound like them you make a gesture you have an idiosyncrasy about you that they had they map you to something else that you're not so as you live your life from this point forward Let's do a little infinite homework here. I want you to ask yourself every once in a while how you're not thinking or how the world isn't thinking. Do a psychological experiment and do a sociological experiment with this idea. Try to look at things a different way. How are we not dressing? How are we not making music? How are we not conversating with each other? And is there something better Maybe there's not. But is there something more interesting? Think about how every trend invents itself. Well, we didn't dress like we did in the 40s before we had the 40s. Same with the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. We seem to have lost such a gigantic portion of creativity in this world that we're starting to suffer artistically. And for anyone who uh, may have, and I doubt it's any of you, 
but you know if you're over 40, you've definitely experienced this most likely. When they defunded the arts in America, which was a very long process, it was definitely probably a 20-year process, they defunded mathematics to help the mind develop logical thinking. You kind of thought about it and you thought, well, this is probably going to hurt us, but I wonder how it's going to manifest itself. How is it going to be visible later and obvious at a later point that we did defund, defund the arts? And we are living in the absolute cesspool of the effect of those changes, right? We got more classes teaching you how to be a transvestite and to deny your biological physiology than we do teaching you how to, you know, think mathematically or how to pick up an instrument and write your own song to grab paint and paint something that's either photoreal or something far more creative, which might be a Picasso or a Jackson Pollock or a Dolly. You know, Dolly is one of my favorite artists of all time because he, he took the literal rendering abilities that he had, which were photoreal, and he took the surrealism of the human condition, the deep, deep subconscious thoughts of man and manifest them into paintings. There's the, um, and I, I, I could stare at his name and I'd barely be able to pronounce it, but there's the Mexican filmmaker who um, tried to make Dune back in the 70s. There's an awesome movie on him. If you look, just look up Dune 1970s, you'll find this project and he he really caught Mobius and put him in the film business. He took, took H.R. Giger and put him in the film business and a bunch of other folks. He was never able to get the film made. But I, I recently sat with a colleague of mine in the writing business and mentioned this guy. And he said, uh, well, what he created was complete rubbish because I saw his first two films and they were just junk. So he was like, I'm glad he didn't make Doom. Now, the real backstory with this guy is that he was so imaginative and so amazing. Of course, he hired the best talent on planet Earth at the time. And Mobius is responsible for a gigantic part of this as well, if not the overwhelming majority. But he did work very closely with this guy. And this dude was just a visionary, man. His first two movies were very esoteric at the same time they were linear. His visuals on his second film, which he had a ton of money to make, are the closest I've ever seen someone render a movie that looks like you're on acid, which is exactly his goal. He actually said, I wanted you to be able to experience drugs without actually taking any. His storyboard that he paid Mobius to draw as well as um, a few other brilliant designers as like Giger and uh, I forget this other guy's name, he does spaceships. He's a British guy, brilliant. It was so ripped off in Hollywood after he turned it in that it is responsible for several Steven Spielberg scenes. It was responsible for the scene in uh, Indiana Jones when they opened the Ark of the Covenant at the first film and all those you know the ghost spirits come out and the guy's face melts and it goes through all the chests of all of the um nazis and then the two lovers are tied to a stake and they're just keeping their eyes closed and looking around that's his movie that's not that's the mexican guy's movie not spielberg's movie he just saw it in this book which hollywood made copies of and they just poached it to death it was amazing and it's sad that in this world, those, those who are that creative, because we don't think like they do, they don't get their, their heyday that they deserve. I would like to create a world where these harmless geniuses get their day, you know, because we're missing out on a lot of artwork and a lot of inspiration and a lot of enlightenment, in my opinion, because... We don't have those individuals contributing at the rate we used to. But of course, you know, 
I have to be careful about how I say this, but you know, you'll hear me from time to time. And I did a whole episode on LSD. You know, there's the unfortunate thing about LSD is that there's no way safe. There's no safe way to get pure, real LSD. There, you know, if you're buying stuff off the web or getting it from somebody you don't know, you might be getting some really harsh stuff that has nothing to do with LSD that's going to make you hallucinate for sure and have a really weird experience, but it could kill you. And so I can never recommend someone go out and get LSD, but I've been privileged to get it twice from an extremely reliable source, which is the Grateful Dead drummer's wife. Not from her directly, but from people who had access to her stash. And I had some mind-blowing experiences. In fact, I did three trips on this stuff. But, you know, we know that people have been eating mushrooms and all kinds of psychedelics for years. And having these experiences and then becoming the oracles of their communities. Especially the designers of sacred geometry architecture. Because that's what you see. You understand things so much better, and you become such a, uh, a peaceful version of a human, you know? You do need to make sure that you're not also... I mean, you, you should watch my episode on LSD if you're close to that experience, just to make sure you're ready for it. My buddy vetted me for four or five years before he said, I think you would be a great candidate to take this, because you don't have any skeletons in, in your closet. You really are who you say you are and that kind of thing. And he was right. I mean, he was, I needed to have that vetting before I took any of this stuff, because if I was hiding a bunch of demons, uh, that apparently brings down all your barriers and then whatever's in you comes out. And so the reason why people have what they call a bad trip is because they shouldn't be taking it in the first place. And typically my friends who have taken it and say they'll never take it again, they have unfortunate childhoods and really bad experiences. So I understand. Anyway, I thought this episode would be fun just to kind of jostle your brain, kind of get us off all the um, specifics of life. We need this kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's such a sad situation that we don't have a community, you know, meetup group where we can actually have these conversations because they're probably very hard to police in the first place. We'd have to create some sort of agenda where someone goes up and speaks, like I just spoke, and they're the center of the evening, and then we break apart and have the conversation about what that person said. Because trying to jam a bunch of people's brains in on a bunch of weird topics would just be hard to um, herd, as they say. But anyway, give us some thought. And if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. I'll make a fairly short bumper today. There's two audio, YouTube and BitChute. There's a perfect link to the podcast for both Android and the iOS. There are three social medias as of today. There's Facebook, Twitter, and Minds.com. There's two ways to contribute to the site directly, which is PayPal and Patreon. There's two products if you download them from the website. Supposedly, there's an affiliate to that, which is the Brave Browser and the Backblaze Black Backup Software. You won't find any episode ones on this particular channel because they've been moved to another channel. Remember, this is a variety show. I want to say that so people don't drop off. You see an episode you don't like, just don't watch it. Something else will come back around. But the website has over 400 and, geez, at least 450 episodes. So if you're new to the channel, there's plenty of stuff for you to listen to, plus a category list that can get you directly to what you want to see. If I am missing an episode that you would love to hear, please suggest it in the comments section. Just know that if you want me to read a book, probably not going to happen. If you want me to watch a four-hour video, you're going to need to paraphrase the video first before I'm going to jump in. And you may need to be the producer to get me to hop into the more intense things. But some of you have made little tiny comments, one-sentence comments that have turned into some of the best episodes I've ever made. So definitely trust yourself. The other thing is, if you think you're subscribed to this channel on YouTube, please make sure you are. If you're not on BitChute, please go make an account because they need your support. This is our, this is the only other channel in the world uh, that is uncensored, which has all the same powers as YouTube. There's an app for your phone as well. 
So click the bell if you want notifications. I think that's about it. Until the, until the next episode, take care of yourself and someone else. And I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.